Hi Cozy Friends! We talk a lot about hobbies over here. Over the past year we've made several Cozy Hobby List videos. I think we've covered almost all of them at this point. And we've had our fair share of Cozy Hobby vlogs. We love hobbies over here, okay? Especially Cozy Hobbies. But throughout our journey of discovering and collecting hobbies together like the little hobby hoarders we are, I've realized there are some that are definitely more beginner friendly and then others that take quite a bit of front-loaded learning and effort to really get into. And while I truly believe you can learn Learn any hobby that you put your mind to. Today I just want to share the hobbies that I feel like you can just jump into without a tutorial stage, if you will. So if you're someone who kind of gets intimidated by the learning process and then puts off starting that hobby at all because of that, you'll have a bunch to choose from that are super easy to get started and don't require too many complicated tools. So let's jump right into our first cozy hobby. Number one is coloring. I feel like this is the perfect starter hobby. Like anyone who is dipping their toe into the cozy hobby world for the first time, I feel like the gateway hobby is coloring. It's definitely kind of taken off on social media recently, but I feel like it's been one of those things forever of like adult coloring books to calm down, coloring books for stress and anxiety. Like it has been around for a long time and for a reason, it's just, so simple to get into. There's no learning, there's no, oh no, I have to be good at this. There's there's none of that. There's no mental barriers. You can really just color in between lines. <laughs> the hardest thing you have to do when coloring is choosing a color. That's really the hardest thing. Even that is a lovely, pleasant process. So I love getting a bunch of coloring books that I don't need. <laughs> That's like one of my favorite things is to get coloring books from artists that I really love. This is uh, Bobby Good. I know her coloring books are like so sought after. She'll have a release, they'll sell out in like seconds. I just love her art so much. This is just an example. It's just like very cute, nostalgic animals. I haven't touched this coloring book because I'm scared to <laughs> until she comes out with like releases that everybody can get a coloring book if they want to. I am not touching that coloring book because I feel like it is a gem. However, I do have multiple coloring books from Creative Haven. They are my favorite coloring book company because the art is just so cute. Sometimes I think coloring book art can be a little bit corny or just like, I don't know, especially when they're marketed towards adults. Sometimes they can be like, I don't know, <laughs> just a little bit corny. And I like kind of the nostalgic feel of a lot of the Creative Haven artists. It reminds me of the coloring pages they would give us in school like years ago. You know what I mean? There's just like a really beautiful nostalgic feel to the art. And there's details that you can really dive into but then there's some really simple ones too and I really like the variety. I love getting seasonal ones that you can just go ham on during certain seasons. So I have like the country Christmas one. I have an autumn charm one. It brings me so much joy to color and I also love finding and collecting little markers that I really like. My favorites are the Crayola super tips because they don't bleed through the page. So if you look back here this is another marker that I have that bleeds through the page. Sometimes that's fine. Sometimes like if you like the marker, it's worth it for it to bleed through the page, but I don't really love for markers to bleed through the page. So I love Crayola Super Tips because they never, not even a little, not even a hint of bleeding through the page. However, a lot of people like, I think they're called Ohuhu markers. I have a couple. I do really like how they glide across a page and you can kind of get precise with it but they do bleed a lot and I think some people just don't mind that and that's fine but I do mind that a little bit. But coloring, all you need is a coloring book and markers. You don't even need a coloring book. You can get a printer, paper, draw your own coloring page and then color that. So basically you just need markers <laughs> and paper. But coloring books are so affordable. I know they have Creative Haven either at Michael's or Joann's. They also have them on Amazon. That's where I get all of mine. And I think they're like five dollars give or take a couple dollars. Very affordable and they last you so long. Like I've had these for two seasons and I haven't even gotten through them so they last a long time and I love them. Next are activity books. These are gonna look very different for different people's needs but regardless all you need is the book and a pencil. There's really nothing to prep, there's nothing to prepare, there's nothing to know. Just get an activity book. Pick one up. They have some adult ones. I don't think this is meant to be an adult one but it's also not 
like super childish so it's kind of a nice brain off activity book <laughs> that I like to pick up. There's coloring in this, there's crossword puzzles, word searches, <laughs> there's like connect the dots, finish a drawing. I think this is a really good balance between like a kiddish activity book and like an adult activity book where it's just like really hard crossword puzzles and Sudoku. It's like there's a time and place for that but sometimes I just actually don't want to have to think too much and I just want to like do some slight brain movement. Not brain strain, you know what I mean? So activity books are great for that. This one I just happened to find I think at Target. I'm sure there's a ton again on Amazon, on your favorite book site or your local bookstore. I feel like I don't hear people talking a lot about activity books unless it's like an actual crossword puzzle book or like Sudoku book. So look for ones that kind of blend different activities together so that you can switch between them when you get bored with one thing, you know? The next amazing beginner hobby is gem painting, specifically the smaller gem paintings because there's the really large ones and those are great, but I feel like that really takes a dedicated space for crafts in my opinion. And as like a beginner hobbier crafter, if you're just jumping in, you might not have a dedicated space yet. And that might be difficult to tackle. And it's just kind of like an intimidating feat, just like a week's worth of work to get the gem painting done. But the mini ones are my favorite. I'm getting ahead of myself. If you don't know what gem painting is, some people call it diamond painting. Basically you have this little collection of gems and they're all separated in different colors when you get the pack. It's essentially paint by number with gems. So you kind of have this little sticky thing you stick the tool into, pick up a gem, and then you put it on the designated space based on the like letter or number or symbol that the little color pack is. In the end, you have this kind of beautiful art piece made out of gems and it's almost like pixel art. It's beautiful. It's beautiful and it's so soothing and fun to actually complete. I love doing it while I'm like watching a show or listening to an audiobook, listening to a podcast, watching YouTube. I love doing this while doing something else because it's so easy to like you don't really have to focus that much. You're just looking at which gem goes to which symbol on the little painting. It's such a good beginner hobby because there's really nothing to learn. You're just connecting numbers and letters and such into a beautiful little work of art. And specifically, I like the small ones for beginners, like I said, because doing the large ones can kind of be intimidating. I started with a large one. I wish I didn't because I was so intimidated that I just didn't pick it up for like six months after I started it. I was like, I can't do it. It's too much. There's too many gems and the thing's too big and I just, I don't know. So getting the little small ones, there's a company. The name is lost on me right now. I'll put it in the description or on the screen. And then Michael's has their own set of small ones and big ones so you can like start with the small one like I did I got this little mushroom kit from Michaels I loved it there's like six I think different kinds of mushroom paintings to do oh they're so fun they're so fun so I think that's a perfect thing to kind of just like pick up for an evening you can have never done it before in your life and you can easily pick it up one evening finish it in the same evening it's so satisfying <laughs> next is something that is going to shove you back into your childhood you're gonna be hit with a wave of nostalgia and that is parlor beads. Do y'all remember parlor beads? Please tell me y'all remember parlor beads. For some reason, us children in like the 2000s were, were nonstop doing parlor beads. We were like in a, what's it called? <laughs> assembly line doing perler beads over and over. That's what it felt like looking back. I'm like, why were we doing so many perler beads? Who was making us do so many perler beads? I think having done so many as a child, I like repressed the fact that they existed. And then I was awoken recently and remembered that they exist in adulthood. I was like, wait, those are actually fun. And so, so easy. All you need is a little palette to put them on. And Michaels has them, Amazon has them. Little palette, you just need some beads. And you can customize your own little grid, little piece of art. You can do animals, you can do do characters from books or video games or movies that you like. They have preset kits. They didn't have this back in the day for us, but they have like little preset kits that basically give you a guide on different animals to do, or they have ones from like movies. Like we got a Star Wars one, but we only got it because we like the colors, not because we wanted to make Star Wars characters, but it teaches you how to do it. Like it's just a simple, kind of like the gem painting. It's like, put this color here, put this color here. You're good to go. And then all you need to do, put some parchment paper on it, iron it, it's done. It's done. It's so easy. I mean, if it's a if it's a hobby and a craft that they shoved in all of the children's faces in the 2000s, we can do it in adulthood. <laughs> but it is just such a simple, satisfying craft to do. Like I love the tactile element of it where you're picking up these little beads, you're putting them in the thing, and then you're ironing and you can feel them kind of squishing. Something about that is so satisfying and so nostalgic. And even if you didn't do them as a kid, I think
think you would really enjoy it. And just the ability to like make whatever you want. You can make a little pearl or bead thing of your cat, your friends, a video game character, a Stardew Valley chicken, <laughs> whatever you want. And then you can like make it into a keychain. You can make a bookmark. There's so many things to do. The opportunities are endless and it's just such an easy one to jump into. Next is one I had not thought about ever really <laughs> until recently. And that is construction paper art. This has not even been on a cozy hobby list of ours. Construction paper art is so cool, you guys. It's so cool and it's so easy to get started because again, all you need, construction paper, scissors, glue. That's all you need. And then the world is your oyster. You don't have to learn anything. You don't have to sit in front of a computer for hours learning a tutorial on how to cut and glue. You already know how to do that. Those are skills we learned as children. You just cut construction paper and put it together into like a piece of art. So you can make, you know, like a flower, a nature scene all through just construction paper. I've seen some really, really cool advanced ones on Pinterest. If you want some like Pinterest inspo, you can search construction paper art. It will blow you away. And there's some that like definitely take a lot of skill and a lot of practice and like knowledge of shading and things like that. But then there's some that are just kind of like simple, but still really cool. Like you can make an orange by just cutting a circle of orange and then a little sliver of shading of a slightly darker orange. You've got an orange. You know what I mean? It's so easy. It's not something that's like punishing if you mess up a little because guess what? Just cut a new one. I think it's also a great way to recycle and reuse things. So if you have, you know, packaging around your house from food, cardboard containers or packages that you've got in the mail. Save it, keep it stockpiled if it's like a fun color or a fun pattern or something, and then you can use it in your construction paper art. Ah, I just think it's so cool. And you can also add to it with like markers and things like that if you'd like, but I really like the idea of just keeping it simple, working with a new medium of just paper and seeing what you can do with it. You don't need to go that crazy. You don't need to learn any new skills. You just cut and paste and see what comes of it. I'm really excited to try this out. I just ordered a ton of construction paper of different colors and I'm gonna test this out in my new craft room that I just made. If you haven't seen my little makeover of my craft room, check it out. But construction paper art and the next hobby I'm gonna talk about are both like the first activities that I want to do in that craft space. I'm so excited. Okay, so what is the next hobby? It's beading. Remember beading? It's all of these hobbies we had back in the day as children and then we forgot about them. Remember? You simply have a little thread, a little plastic thread, and you have little beads and you can sh 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 weave them together to make a little lizard keychain, to make a little butterfly keychain, to make something 3D. Now this one, I will say, you do have to look up a tutorial. A lot of the time, how to exactly weave the two rows of threads together isn't immediately intuitive, but it's such an easy tutorial to follow. It's such an easy craft to get into that I think this absolutely belongs on this list. It's not like, oh no, I have to learn this new stitch or this new <laughs> method of da 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 and I have to keep it in my head forever, otherwise I'm never gonna be able to do it again. No, it's just like follow the tutorial on the screen and you're good to go. It's it's easy in the same way that like the gem painting and paint by number and perler bees are where you're kind of just following a grid and assigning colors to that. And there's so much room to grow with this hobby. Like again, Pinterest has all the good inspo, but if you look up beading tutorials, if you look up like beaded blank, like anything you want beaded. If you want a beaded dragon, if you want a beaded picnic basket, if you want a beaded tree, a beaded house, there is a version of it on Pinterest and probably a pattern for you on Pinterest. But when you look at all of those inspirations, if you, when you look at all those projects on Pinterest, you can see how much room there is to grow in this hobby. Like it does start out super easy, super simple, 2D, not really 2D, but kind of like 2D, make that lizard that we all made back in the day as a keychain and keep it pushing. But you can also grow and do 3D versions of things. You can do so much with this hobby. So I think it's a really cool one because it is a beginner hobby. It is something that's so easy to jump into, but you can also grow and make it basically as involved and intense and complicated as you want and have like a whole beaded village, if you would like, a whole beaded farm of animals, if you would like. The one that got me into beading and made me want to try beading for the first time was seeing a beaded chicken on Pinterest. I said, give me her. 
her. I need her. I will be making her ASAP. So <laughs> if anyone was curious about my personal inspiration for beading, it's a chicken. So excited to hear about yours. <laughs> Next is one that y'all always tell me about on my cozy hobby list videos because I've talked about, you know, embroidery and things like that where yes, it's a little bit easier to get into, but you still have to learn certain like stitches and how to do those particular stitches and how to work those stitches together with other stitches. And there's a lot of technicalities to learn while you are starting. And like I've talked about it being a generally easy beginner hobby, but I wouldn't quite put it on this list because I want this list to truly be like bare bones. You could start today and finish a project at the end of the day. But adjacent to embroidery is cross stitching. And y'all always tell me about this and you're like, it's way easier than embroidery. It is like the easiest thing ever. Cross stitch. Shing. You're doing one single kind of stitch the whole time. And there are some different things you can do. There are some different stitches you can learn, but like at its core, you only have to know one stitch and do that stitch the whole entire time. And it's very similar, especially with like cross stitching kits and cross stitching tutorials. Like it's very similar to all of the things we talked about today where you're just following one by one by one by one by one by one. And it's so difficult to mess up. And even if you mess up, it's like so easy to fix. So cross stitching is is if you want to get into textile crafts like embroidery and maybe eventually crochet knitting all of those things I think cross stitching is like the perfect starter this perfect entry point into textile crafts as a whole because you're just working with like one base stitch and working through a grid with that one basic stitch if that makes sense so according to all the textile crafters cross stitching is the easiest textile craft to kind of jump into for the first time I would say cross stitching is probably the hobby on this list that requires the most tools, but I would say it's pretty simple tools. Like it's tools you might already have around the house. It's thread, it's a needle. The only things you would have to buy are like a cross stitching hook and then the canvas that you're cross stitching on. But that's two things. And then the rest you probably have in your home. If not, they have like really simple cross stitching kits that you can get on like Amazon or just like get the basic items at Michael's. Next is puzzles. I love puzzles. This is such a good hobby. I've talked about puzzles damn near every cozy hobby list because it's just such a good one to hop into and hop into at any skill level. You can do a 10 piece puzzle. You could do a 20 piece puzzle, 50 piece puzzle, 100,000. It's really a choose your own adventure when it comes to puzzles. Do you want it to be easy? Do you want it to be medium difficulty? Do you want it to be insanely hard and take you weeks to finish? It's up to you. And there's really nothing to learn with puzzles. Like there's kind of a technique that you suss out within yourself. Everybody has their own puzzling technique, but that's not something that you have to spend months and months learning that's just something that kind of comes to you as you're working through the puzzle you know you're shifting through and you're like okay I think I'm gonna do this section first I think I'm gonna do edges first I think I'm gonna do xyz first that's just something that you come up with on your own and it just comes from within you you know it's not something that you're taught I love that about puzzles and I also love that you can do it while doing other things you can do it as a communal activity you can invite people over for a puzzle party you can do it with your family while you're watching a movie I just love the communal aspect aspect of puzzles, but I also love that you could you could put on an audiobook, sit there, say don't talk to me, maybe bring me snacks, but don't talk to me for the entire day and sit at a coffee table, sit at a dining table and da -da 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 finish your puzzle. So it can be solitary, it can be communal, it can be whatever you want it to be, but I love the flexibility of that and I love that you don't have to know a dang thing to hop right into a puzzle. I love that. I would say I would look at puzzle guides if you don't know how many pieces is like what difficulty level. I would maybe look up like a puzzle guide like if I'm doing this myself and I only want to do it for one hour, like how many pieces should I get type of thing. But other than that, I think it's really hard to go wrong with starting puzzles for the first time. I think you're good to go. I trust y'all. Y'all got it. You got this. <laughs> the next hobby is Lego sets. I want every adult to reconnect with their inner child and build at least one Lego set in your adulthood, in your, in your, in your adulthood. Okay. <laughs> and especially, especially if you didn't really play with Legos as a child, because I didn't. My upbringing was very much, I'm playing with the girly, 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 girly toys. That wasn't necessarily a choice that was out of my hands. It was kind of just like, oh, you like dolls. So then we're only ever going to get you girly, girly, girly toys. And it's not like I was asking for Legos or anything, but like that was just never something that I thought about because I didn't think it was for me. So I never got to play with Legos as a kid. I think maybe sometimes I would like mess around with my brother's Legos, but it was never in a way that I felt like it was for me. That's not to say I was like deprived of, no one deprived me of 
of a Lego experience as a kid. I just, I never had that experience. And so I can't be like, I had this nostalgic moment and I'm reconnecting with that in adulthood. No, I just feel like I'm giving myself this experience in adulthood that I just didn't have in childhood. And it's so much fun. It's so much fun. And even apart from all of that, apart from like reconnecting with childhood, it's just fun. Like it's just a really, really fun, time consuming and the best way activity that takes zero prior knowledge at all. I promise. If you're like, but I've never touched a Lego and I don't know how they fit together. The instructions on Lego should be like a case study for the best instructions period for anything <laughs> like Ikea take notes, any furniture company building instructions take notes, anything with instructions take notes, okay? Lego makes you feel like I can do this. I can do anything. And they have so many cute Lego sets these days. Some of them are expensive. I will say that is the, that is the biggest barrier to entry on this hobby is price. These things are per pricey, okay? Especially the bigger sets, pricey. However, they have like off-brand Legos on Amazon that I've done and I love those. Those are cheaper if you wanna do off-brand Legos. And then Lego also has kind of smaller kits that are more catered towards kids, but they're still fun to do. Like the little Minecraft kits, those are really fun to do. I've done like the little girly ones. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the like name brand of them, but they have like ones marketed towards girls and those are fun too. They're really small kits. They're just so fun, you guys. Guys, they're so fun and there's like nothing at all that you have to know beforehand to get into it. I know I've said that a million times, but I promise there, there really isn't. And it seems like, oh my gosh, I feel like you have to understand engineering and no, you really don't. You really don't. And then there is the side of Lego where you can mess around and build your own things. I don't touch that. I haven't touched it yet. I'm still on the, I will follow a tutorial. Exactly. I will follow the instructions word for word to be able to finish something. That's where I'm at in my Lego journey. And that's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. But there's some people who like to kind of build their own things. Maybe someday I'll get there. Maybe someday I'll get there. But you don't have to. Again, it's they make it so easy. And there's ranges from like cheap off-brand to like their most expensive, really beautiful, huge bills. Oh my gosh. <sighs> there's something for everybody. Okay, my next hobby is one that I have not talked about on any of my cozy hobby lists and that is content creating. And I think I've never talked about it cause I've been like, ah, nobody wants to do this. <laughs> like girl, don't, don't fool yourself. Nobody else wants to do this. And I don't know, I feel like I, I look around more and I'm like, I feel like I see a rise in people kind of just wanting to share their interests and do it in a way that's like, I don't necessarily want to become a YouTuber, become a TikToker, come or whatever. But I just want to like share something. I want to share something about myself. I want to share my own stories. I want to share me coloring. I want to share me building Legos. You know what I mean? And seeing content creating as a hobby is what got me to where I am today. And again, that's not to say everyone wants to be a content creator. So you should just get started and then you'll be a content creator. Like I understand not everybody wants that. And I didn't think that I wanted that either. For the whole first year that I was doing content creating, it was solely just to have something to do like just a hobby to do in law school when I felt like I didn't have an outlet. I didn't have any kind of outlet <laughs> and I was stressed and I was like looking for some way to express myself, looking for some way to connect with people about passions and found that through creating content in the gaming space. And it was just so fulfilling. So I think if you really enjoy sharing things with people and connecting with communities, or maybe you don't know if you enjoy those things, but you think you might, or you feel like you might be missing community in your lives or might be missing something some kind of connection point. Definitely look into content creating. It's so, all you need is your phone. All you need is your phone and a free editing app. I use CapCut. You use what you have, which is whatever you wanna make content about. You don't have to get new things. You don't have to buy new clothes. You don't have to whatever. You just make content about what you're passionate about and connect with those communities in that way. And there's so many like niche communities you can get into and you can connect with. I promise it makes you feel so seen and connected in a way that a lot of things don't. A lot of things don't. It's definitely like when people talk about, ooh, find clubs when you're in college or like find clubs in adulthood, find like classes to go to. Some people don't have access to that. Some people don't want to do IRL in-person things. Content creation is a perfect perfect way to do that from like the comfort of your own home. You also just don't have to create the content yourself. You can just engage in communities of like another content creator, join communities built either around a content creator or built around just like a certain topic. There's discord servers and TikTok communities all built around super, super niche communities. And there's nothing more fulfilling than being able to just like communicate on a daily basis with people who just like get you and are passionate about the same things you're passionate about. It's 
underrated for sure. I think especially my generation is shifting from this like internet stranger danger mentality to like, okay, there is some merit to people on the internet and connecting with people on the internet, but still being in this like mentality of, is it weird for me to connect with people on the internet? Is it weird for me to make internet friends? Like I can just go hang out with my IRL friends or I can just, you know, hang out with myself. Like, there's this kind of thing you grapple with, I think as a, I'm a millennial, but I think like millennial millennials are still kind of, I, and even some Gen Z are still grappling with that. Like are internet relationships valid, you know? I think the younger generations, that's kind of inherent in how they communicate on the internet is like validating internet relationships as like just as valid as their IRL ones. So I think that's just something to think about definitely as an adult is either content creating in a space that makes you happy, that makes you feel fulfilled, that's sharing something that you care about or just sharing your life, sharing your stories. I think everybody has interesting stories to share and everyone wants to hear them. I feel like for a long time there's this narrative of like no one wants to hear about your life, no one cares about your life. And most people do. We do actually. We're pretty nosy and pretty like bored and <laughs> would love to hear about each other's experiences. So I think that narrative is also changing. Again whether it's creating for yourself it's super easy to get started and like maybe you won't be perfect at it at the start but then you learn and grow. If you look at my first videos and pictures rough <laughs> okay rough is all i'll say but once you keep going at it for years and years like you automatically learn it's not something you like necessarily have to think about as you're learning and growing you just kind of do because you learn and grow i don't know <laughs> it's just like little tips and tricks and like little things you realize are your specific content creating voice you know and that takes a while and that's okay but to jump into to start requires nothing requires absolutely nothing okay you can just turn on the camera and do whatever speak to you. And then the other end of that is just finding communities to connect with because community is a hobby, okay? If you look at finding and building and nurturing and fostering communities and taking part in community as a hobby, I promise you will lead a much more fulfilling life. You know, hobbies are something you do to pour back into yourself and really give yourself the gift of, I don't know, like a fun activity. And if you look at community building that way, I promise you will have so much fulfillment in life. You'll kind of look around and be like, oh, this is what I was missing. So maybe not for everybody, but that was my experience and I know that's a lot of people's experience in my own personal community and just internet friends that I've made that have now become like real life friends. So consider it, consider it. I know it's not the typical hobby that's, you know, recommended, but as a content creator, I was like, hold on a sec. There is some value to this and it's easy to get started. That's that on that. The next hobby is collecting. Now this does require a little bit of funds, perhaps if you're collecting something that, you know, you're purchasing, but the concept of collecting is, I don't know, something we all understand. <laughs> it's seeing something we like, and buying, trading, procuring it, okay? That's something we all do every day in all different kinds of ways for all different kinds of reasons. But this is a fun procuring, okay? This is a, this is exciting procuring. And collecting can be so fun. I collect so many things that I, I honestly don't even think of as like my hobbies of collecting. The only one I will think of in that way were sunny angels and like calico critters, which I have in like a little collection over there and mini food figurines. Those are the things that I faithfully collect collect and probably will my whole life. I definitely hit my limit on Sunny Angels, but anytime I come across a mini food, I have to get it. I have to buy it. I just have to. <laughs> if you watch any of my vlogs, you know <laughs> how true that is. So I have literally like a basket of collected mini foods. You could call my stuffy collection a collection of sorts. And there's like certain figurines that I always like to get things of like Gudetama. I love a little Gudetama moment. I also have like a small Tamagotchi collection. I also just collect things that are nostalgic to me. Like it, it doesn't have to be one category. Like I'll just collect things that are so deeply nostalgic to me that I just want to have them around again. Like there was this paper doll book. I forget what the company is like crafts, crafts or something. Crayons, crayons. I don't know. I'll put a picture up, but there's this paper doll book that I had as a kid. And I like spent hours and hours and hours with this paper doll book, like playing with it myself, playing it with my brother. Like this paper doll book was so integral to my childhood memories. And I suddenly remembered it existed in adulthood. I was like, I have to have that. I have to have it in my possession right now. So I've collected things like that, where it's just like some like positive childhood memory, some positive nostalgic thing. 
item that I just want to have around. And so I have like that. I have some Magic Treehouse books just because it's nostalgic. I have like my first breast doll that I ever got. I got like a new version of her. Basically what I'm saying is like collecting can be a specific thing. You're collecting sunny angels. You're collecting calico critters. Or it can be just like you collect things that are meaningful to you. And that can mean whatever that means to you. That can have no label, no category. It can just be you're collecting something that has X meaning to you. You know what I mean? Again, like you don't need any, there's no rules to collecting. There's nothing you need to get started. It's just you determining what sparks joy for you, what you'd like to have around you and getting started on collecting. I will say with collecting, don't burn, you know, too fast, too bright, too quickly, all of that. Because I think I did that with Sunny Angels. I was like obsessed with it at first and I was like getting as many as possible. And then I kind of burnt out a little bit. I think it is more meaningful to collect as you go or like as you go somewhere meaningful to you or like collect a certain item for your collection at certain milestones for you like assign kind of a meaning to it and then when you're starting a new collecting hobby I think that hobby will have more meaning to you or like that specific collection will have more meaning to you instead of just like the act of collecting the act of like buying and collecting is a little bit less meaningful but collecting looks different for everybody and if that's how you actually like to collect and that brings joy for you then by all means do that then there's other little silly things like I don't even consider these collections I have like a collection of switch charms I have a collection of pins that I've just gotten from like various events or PR packages or something like I just have pins collected and then I have switch charms collected it doesn't even have to be something that's like so intentional and meaningful to you it can just be something that like suddenly you really look around and you realize I have a lot of these <laughs> that also counts and that's amazing my next hobby is a joint one I'm joining two together and that is sticker by number and paint by number these are like literally the easiest things you could possibly step into as a first hobby as a first craft whatever you just simply get the kit get the book there's kits from Michaels there's kits from Amazon there's books from Michaels books from Amazon all you have to do is just assign the color to the number and again they like the gem painting ones they have big ones they have small ones like start in a way that feels manageable to you but they have all kinds of like levels of investment that you want to put into it and then for sticker by number all you're doing is connecting the pattern to the number that the page is telling you to do <laughs> I wish I had my book up here right now to show you but it's just the simplest like you're looking at the guide you're pulling one you're putting it on where the guy's telling you to put it it's so simple so easy both of these are like perfect for just wanting to get into the swing of things wanting to get into like that crafting spirit the crafting energy while maybe you're listening to an audiobook watching something listening to music and just having something tactile to do with your hands and having like this beautiful finished product at the end I love I absolutely love these kind of hobbies where literally anybody can pick up and do it and you have this beautiful finished product at the end that you can feel so proud of and you can feel so happy with yourself that you took that time to rest it's like this tangible proof of rest that you've given yourself and I love that the next one is book annotation so basically reading <laughs> but with a little added twist to it a little added element of analysis and kind of this fun again like there's a tactile experience to it because reading is is a very tactile thing but you are kind of just sucked into this world and that's what I love about it so much like obviously anybody can pick up a book and start reading so that's why it's on this list but annotating is kind of a different way to approach the hobby of reading. It's a new one for me and I'm really enjoying it. I think it makes you engage with reading differently. Like I said, regular reading, you're sucked into this world and you can kind of fly by and you've experienced the story, but maybe you haven't stopped to engage with it critically or, you know, formed your own thoughts in between. You're kind of like just sucked in and working through it kind of like you would, you know, a show or a movie where you're just like deep in it and you're experiencing the story of it. I don't like to do annotating for all books because I really like that experience in reading books. I love being sucked into it and I look up and I'm like, oh my god, I just experienced that whole story. Where am I? Oh my gosh. I love that experience and I particularly love that for like fantasy books and especially like romanticy books. But for some books, I feel like the experience is almost better when you are stopping throughout and like critically engaging with the literature. You know what I mean? You have a moment where you stop after each chapter or after each each page even and you're like what did that mean to me what did that mean for me what did that tell me did it tell it well enough did it get that point across in an efficient way did it get the point across in a meaningful way did it get the point across at all did it get the point across in a stupid way that I didn't like do I care about these characters why do I care about these characters do I like the diction of the writing do I like the writing style do I like the voice
voice of the characters. There's some books where it's just so much more interesting and so much better of an experience to interact with reading it in that way. And I think book annotation is one, super easy to get started. Like you don't have to learn anything. It's kind of like puzzles. It's just like whatever works for you. And two, it's just like a new added way to engage with this hobby that a lot of us have probably been doing forever and ever. Reading is something we all do, but then book annotation kind of adds this fun element to it. But the way that I do it is ways that I've picked up from like book talk and bookstagram and Pinterest and things like that. But it's getting a bunch of little tabs, little transparent sticky notes, and then highlighters. And then you kind of tab the front of the book and you say, okay, these are the things that I want to call out, whether it's like quotes, whether it's writing that I like, whether it's, you know, like plot points that I specifically want to reference back to, whatever you want to call out. Write that down in the front and then like assign sticky tab colors to it. And then as you're going, you can kind of highlight quotes that you like, you can highlight plot elements that are like turning points or something that you really want to reference back. And then you just do, 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 sticky tab all of those different items that you've highlighted. You write notes in the book or you can write notes on the like transparent sticky notes or non-transparent sticky notes, whatever your preference is. And you do that throughout the book. It's very self-explanatory. You're annotating the book. That's what book annotating is. But like I said, it can really look however you want it to look. If you only want to highlight quotes that you like and then tab the quotes that you like so that you can just go back to it and reference it. That's one way to do it. If you really want to like analyze every single page and talk about what it meant to you in the sticky notes, you can do that. If you want to like critique the writing, you could do that. However you want to engage with book annotation, the world is your oyster and I love that. I just feel like it adds a special way to engage with books that you either have already read and maybe want to approach it with a different lens this time around or engage with like a new book that you know is something you really want to like dissect as you go through it. And I think that's really fun. I think it's also a really good way to work your critical thinking brain. I think there's a lot of activities in life that don't require our critical thinking brain. And so we get used to not flexing that muscle. But I think something like book annotation really gets you thinking, really gets you thinking, really gets you analyzing in a way that I don't think we are asked to do in everyday life. And I love that about it. My very last hobby is the one that I talk about on basically every cozy hobby list video. And that is gaming. <laughs> there is a game out there for everybody. I won't go too in depth on gaming, but I really think there is a game out there for everybody. Whether it's a video game or a board game, but I'm partial to video games at this point in my life because I've always been partial to video games throughout my entire life. But I think there are games for literally everybody and any skill level. Your grandma could pick up Animal Crossing and get into it. Your child could also pick up Animal Crossing and get into it. And you could pick up Animal Crossing and get into it without having ever touched a game in your life. And I think that's so great. I, I'm just using Animal Crossing as an example because there are so many like older generations that have picked it up and played it. So that's the first thing that came to my mind. But there's so many beautiful narrative games. There's so many beautiful exploration games, adventure games that if you've never touched a game in your life, you could hop into and are so beginner friendly. There's some that are definitely not beginner friendly, but <laughs> I would say a lot of the cozy games that I talk about on my channel are very beginner friendly. Yeah. <laughs> Gaming is just such a special, special cozy hobby for me. So I will always talk about it. And I think that it's one similar to Legos where I think a lot of people didn't feel welcomed to play it when they were younger. And so it's kind of foreign to them as a concept or it's seen as this like negative thing of like a time waster or it's violent and things like that when there's so much beauty in gaming and so much peace and restful moments, just like there is in reading and watching shows and puzzles and everything else. So if you haven't explored gaming, I have so, so, so many videos on it on my channel if you'd like to try and dive into it, but definitely an amazing hobby that does not require any prior knowledge and requires very few tools. Like you can either full send and invest in a Switch if you've never done that before, or if you already have a Switch, a new game can be very reasonably priced. Or if you have like an iPad or a phone, trying some cozy games on your iPad or phone and seeing if you like that before you dive into something that is a little bit pricier like a Switch. Those are all of the cozy beginner hobbies that I have for you. I hope this sparked some inspiration for you or I hope that this kind of released a mental block you had on like starting any cozy hobbies if you're like I don't know I have to learn them. I hope that this helped you realize there are so many out there that are just so easy to step into for the first time and you can gift yourself the little moment of self-care and rest while you do your hobbies and just invest in yourself and invest in your happiness. That is why I love hobbies so much. 
much because it gives all of that back to you. Happy hobbying. I love you so much. Stay cozy. Bye.